Today we are joined by the leaders of each of the 2012 SCORE Prize winners, Rick Wilson from John Sevier Elementary in Maryville City, Robert Blankenship from Rose Park Math and Science Magnet in Metro Nashville, Peggy Murdoch from Covington High School in Tipton County, and Dr. Dale Lynch from Hamblin County Schools to talk about their work to foster excellent teaching in their schools and districts. Before we begin, I have a couple of quick announcements that we'll share more information about at the end of this convening. First, today, SCORE is launching a Rise to the Challenge campaign to hear from Tennesseans about the ways in which they have committed to advancing one of the five educational priorities outlined in the 2012-2013 State of Education in Tennessee report. Second, next week on June 10th through 12th, SCORE is hosting principal and teacher focus groups throughout Tennessee to gather their feedback about first to the top implementation. More information on both of these events will be shared at the end of today's event. SCORE is an independent, nonprofit, nonpartisan institution founded by former U.S. Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist. SCORE has two main goals as an organization. The first is that every student in Tennessee graduates from high school, prepared for college in the workforce, and the second is that Tennessee becomes the fastest improving state in the nation with regard to student achievement outcomes. Our work is grounded in the four pillars that drive student achievement, embracing high standards, cultivating strong district and school leaders, ensuring excellent teaching, and using data to enhance student learning. Um, just another quick announcement before we continue, um, to orient you all it's into what you're seeing, on the left side of the screen we have all of the slides that are supporting um, the conversation. On the top right you'll see a Q&A box where um, someone on our staff is sending out a summary of the conversation and it's also an avenue for you all to ask questions as you think of them. And finally, we have files available below that Q&A box that we will be referring to throughout the discussion. So SCORE conducts our work because the world has changed and what is required to be successful has significantly increased. To meet these new challenges, Tennessee has committed to a bold set of reforms to ensure that all students graduate from high school prepared for college and the workforce, from raising academic standards to evaluating teachers and principals in new ways. As a result of this work, in 2012, Tennessee students made the most academic progress in the state's history. In order to ensure that the early progress the state has experienced is maintained and accelerated, it is crucial that we highlight those places that are meeting challenges and share their strategies for success throughout the state. In 2011, SCORE began awarding the SCORE Prize to the elementary, middle, and high school as well as one school district in the state that have most dramatically improved student achievement. All public schools and districts in Tennessee are eligible for the SCORE Prize. We identify winners through a two-step process. The first step solely focuses on student achievement data, including TCAP, TVOS, attendance rates, and college readiness data. Once finalists have been identified, we conduct site visits to each of them to identify those policies and practices that have enabled them to have significant gains in student achievement. <laughs> Last month, SCORE released Pathways to the Prize, Lessons Learned from the 2012 SCORE Prize winners, and these are guidebooks that take a closer look at the work of each of the schools and districts that our panelists represent. These guidebooks contain an in-depth case study of that work of each of the 2012 SCORE Prize winners that falls within the four buckets that drive student achievement, embracing high standards, cultivating strong leaders, ensuring excellent teaching, and using data to enhance student learning. Throughout the guidebook, you will also find links to video clips and other artifacts from the winners that helps to illustrate their stories, as well as a discussion guide in the back with questions to guide self-reflection for practitioners. These guidebooks are also paired with an online self-assessment tool, which includes questions that are aligned with our score prize criteria for superintendents, principals, teachers, P3, 
parents and students so that they can assess how their own communities are performing, as well as links to additional resources to help sustain and accelerate improvement. Now, each of the leaders of the 2012 SCORE Prize winners will introduce themselves and we will move into a facilitated discussion around their work in one particular area that you all told us you wanted to hear more about, ensuring excellent teaching. During the discussion, please submit questions in the Q&A box and our staff will be monitoring them and sharing this with the panelists throughout the discussion. So first up is Rick Wilson, Principal of John Sevier Elementary in Maryville City Schools. And just as a reminder, um, you can unmute yourself by pressing star six. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Yeah. Good, mo good morning or good afternoon, whichever may be the case. Uh, my name is Rick Wilson. I'm currently serving as principal at John Spray Elementary, and it's part of the Maryville City Schools District. I'm beginning my 11th year at John Sevier and uh, my 13th year overall as an administrator and 33rd year overall in education. Our school is a Title I school currently with 548 students. We are a pre-K through third grade setting currently. About 55% of our students are economically disadvantaged, with about 15% of our student population coming from various ethnic backgrounds. The success of our school <clears throat> seems to lie in the, in the strength of our system and the strength of our community. We've had success recently in the philosophy we call teach to the child, which is just simply taking the child from where they are and growing them holistically, academically, socially, and behaviorally. What's been neat about the journey at John Sevier is the fact that we've transitioned from a seasoned staff to one that's uh, quite youthful at this point with uh, less than seven years teaching experience. And also this year was a challenge <laughs> due to the fact that we uh, had a school closure and also had rezoning to go with that. So out of our 548 students, we had uh, nearly 300 students new to our school this year. Thank you, Rick, um, for that great introduction. Next up is Robert Blankenship, Principal of Rose Park Math and Science Magnet right here in Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools. Mr. Blankenship. Good morning. Uh, my name is Robert Blankenship. I'm the principal at Rose Park Magnet Middle School where uh, students are destined for greatness, and we'll talk about that in further detail. I am currently in my 28th year here in Metro, been in the middle school 5-8 setting the entire time. Uh, I'm starting my second year at Rose Park. We have a really unique situation uh, with Rose Park. We're a, uh, a magnet school without any academic requirements, so therefore we can draw students from all over the county, and we do. Uh, our school actually has uh, 35 elementary schools feeding into it uh, that's represented in our fifth grade. We do have kids from every zip code in the county. Uh, it's quite diverse. We're about 62% African American, 25% white, 10% uh, Hispanic, and 3% uh, Asian. Uh, one out of four of students in our school does not speak English at, at their home. So we have about 17 primary languages that are represented at Rose Park, which does uh, present some challenges. Uh, we're about 64% free and reduced lunch. We have uh, students with disabilities is about 5%. And uh, that tops us out of, at Rose Park. Thank you, Mr. Blankenship. Next up is Peggy Murdoch, principal of Covington High School and Tipton County School. Ms. Murdoch? Good morning. I'm Peggy Murdoch, principal of Covington High School. I've been the principal here for the past five years, and I've been in administration for about 14 years. And of course, I've been in education for uh, 36 years. So I've been in education almost all of my life. Um, our most uh, exciting news for our school is that we have focused uh, our attention on what SCORE has talked about, and that is achieving more 
and expecting more so that we will achieve more. And our students have had a 96% graduation rate. We've had about 45% of our current graduating class going to a two- or four-year college, about 20% going into the technology center here uh, and locally uh, to make sure that they get some kind of extra training to enter the job world. And then, of course, we have 10% that are going to the armed forces, which will hopefully lead to a college education as well. Um, our biggest growth area has been in our math scores. Last year, the year that we won the score award, we had 86% of, uh, I'm sorry, 75% of our students uh, to be proficient in Algebra one. And currently, with our last testing season, we've moved that number to 86%, which is unheard of in our area. And our Algebra two scores have moved from 37% to 75% proficient in advance this year. And of course, our teachers are our shining stars. We have no other reason for success other than the teachers that we have. Um, we have uh, instituted uh, PLCs to make sure that we are promoting and encouraging each other. And of course, our mission is to make a positive difference in the life chances of every child that we serve. Thank you for that introduction, Ms. Murdoch, and congratulations on those incredible gains over the last year. We are we're, very, we're excited. Very... <laughs> we're just excited to hear more about how you all did that and the ways you all support teachers to help your students reach those high goals. Thank you. And last but not least is Dr. Dale Lynch, Superintendent of Hamblin County Schools. Dr. Lynch. Good morning. It's uh, an honor to be here with uh, these fine panelists. It's uh, always an opportunity for me as a school leader to, to learn more from uh, some of the outstanding work of our professionals here in Tennessee. So uh, kudos to all the great work that uh, the principals are doing and, and also the teachers from these fine districts. A little bit about Hamlin County Schools is I've been here as superintendent uh, now for 12 years and uh, have been a part of a system that continues to move toward excellence. So uh, we definitely don't think we're there yet, but we're working hard to, to try to learn from others to get better. Um, I think part of the secret of our success is the same secret that everybody else has, is hire great people uh, and make sure that you continue to provide those opportunities of excellence for, for your professionals. Uh, our system here uh, is a, right, a little over 10,000 students. Uh, our system has changed dramatically since uh, since I have become superintendent in 2001, the demographics has changed uh, from now we're almost 69% uh, EL, excuse me, 69% free and reduced lunch. Um, and that has changed just within the last, continues to go up three and four points, percentage points a year. Uh, and also our pre-K program is something that's really um, added to our schools, ex school system's excellence too. But the growth that we have shown in, uh, I think, academic achievement and, and um, just moving kids toward, toward that area of excellence is something I'm obviously very proud of. And we do that by great administrators that you've heard from three here and you're going to hear more. But uh, we try to make sure that we hire the best and we continue to work uh, with them to make sure that they provide those excellent opportunities for our teachers and most importantly for our students. Our Hispanic or our ELL population here in, in Hamlin County uh, is very high. And again, when I first came here in 2001, we were about 1% uh, ELL, and now we're almost at 12 and 13, and it, it continues to grow rapidly. Uh, that's a little bit about our district, and uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Laura. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Lynch, and thank you for, to all of our panelists for those great introductions. Um, it was clear from your opening statements that um, your teachers are such a critical part of the success you all have been able to have. And so one question I would like to ask you all just to begin our conversation is, how do you each define effective teaching? And what expectations do you all have for the teachers in your building or district? Well, uh, th this, is, uh, this is Dale in Hamlin County. As a, as a school system leader, that's where we must begin. I think we first have to start with uh, making sure that we recruit excellent teachers, and those excellent teachers are 
those individuals that have high expectations, realistic expect expectations for students, uh, and making sure they build a relationship with the with students so that they know that uh, they're they're going into a warm and inviting classroom. Laura, this is Peggy Murdoch from Covington High School. I think that our uh, expectation for effective teaching begins with effective planning. Uh, we have preached, so to speak, that nobody can teach well if they don't plan well. And so we have been very strategic about watching the planning and making sure that we have an effective instructional coach with the teachers as they plan, especially those tested areas. And then, of course, moving into executing the team rubric that is our model for observations and evaluations. And we believe that it is a very robust model. And so we make sure that our teachers are following that rubric to the very best of their ab uh, ability. Uh, we also try to do our PLCs with meaningful time spent on sharing with each other what effective teaching looks like and accepting no excuses for failure. If students aren't passing, it is not the student's fault. It's our fault as teachers and leaders, and we need to get to the bottom of what the students are not understanding so that we can break that down a little bit more carefully for the students. And of course, we also, being a high poverty school, 75% of our students are living in poverty and trying to maneuver their way through life in a poverty-stricken area. And so we have really tried to be very culturally responsive to our students who find themselves in poverty and take care of them a little more hands-on and give them opportunities to be successful. And all of that pulled together, uh, we hope, will give us effective teaching in and out of the classroom. Wonderful. Laura, this is Bob Blankenship. When I... Uh hear about effective teaching and, and what it might look like, it, it just reminds me of, of some of the, the things that I reflect back on as a teacher. And the first thing was building relationships. And, and what I look for, uh, first of all, is, is what kind of relationships are being built and that, that's the foundation to, to move forward. They, they really uh, uh, wear many hats and play many roles as a, a teacher. And to be an effective one, they've got to be a learner and, and model that uh, for their students. They're learning with them. They are learning all the time about the nuances of their classroom. Uh, and that's what makes, I believe, teaching such a, a wonderful profession because it's never the same. Um, I like to think of them as coaches, as guides. Uh, they're eternally optimistic, and if I can find those teachers, and we, we have a lot of them, and I've always said it's always going to be the teacher in that classroom, but those are the things that I look for for effective teachers, the planning, uh, the follow-through, but most of all, uh, building those relationships to, to set the foundation for the rest of the work. Wonderful. Mr. Wilson, is there anything you would like to add? No, I agree uh, with a prior statement about everything you do begins and ends with relationships. And I think effective teaching, uh, you know, some of the things the other panelists have mentioned with PLCs and so forth, that's certainly a part of our world now. But I also think that when you're looking at effective teaching, you know, we're looking at a very eclectic approach. We're trying to play off those teachers' strengths and give them support in whatever, you know, means it can be. I think in the end we're all after the same thing. We're trying to recruit, we're trying to retain, and we're trying to develop the very best teachers we can get every day. Absolutely. And so that, that actually leads me in, into another question I would like to pose um, to Ms. Murdoch, but would love the other panelists' thoughts as well. And that's, you know, we have this great vision for effective teaching. They have high expectations, build relationships with students. They're continual learners. They're responsive to their students. Where do you find your teachers? And what incentives, financial or otherwise, do you use to attract potential teacher candidates to your school? Oh, we are located right outside of Shelby County. We're the neighboring county in Tipton County next to Shelby. And so um, that's a a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, 
obviously Shelby County and Metro uh, Memphis is able to uh, pay a greater salary than we can in Tipton County, so that's the negative side. Uh, but there is also the positive side of a smaller community in Tipton County that lures a lot of people to want to teach in our area as opposed to a larger urban site. So we do offer a, a more home feeling to the teachers that come looking for employment. Uh, we do a lot of recruiting to the uh, Tennessee universities. We send out groups that go to their fairs and make sure that we have someone representing our county there. But in, our, in my school, in Covington High School, we're a little unique in that 21 of our 59 teachers are Covington High School graduates. And so they have great ownership in our building and encourage people who are looking for jobs to come and think about Covington High School. So at the end of we are this summer, we have hired two more Covington High School graduates to add to our um, teaching staff to make sure that those who come here know what they're coming to and uh, agree to moving us forward out of many, many uh, areas in their lives of wanting to make sure that their home school is a school that's striving to be the best it can be. Uh, we also have our, our, our uh, Tipton County pay scale is the sixth in the state for new teachers coming in, and many of our teachers have come in since I have been here that are brand new to the profession, and so that is a good thing for them to realize that they're very close to the top in the state as far as their salary for new teachers. And because of our poverty, we are also able to offer a TIF grant uh, to tested teachers. They can improve their salary by $2,200. Uh, with a level five on their teaching capacity. Um, we also have race to the top money for this coming year that will be an additional thousand dollars if we meet our AMOs and closure uh, of gaps. So there are some things that can help teachers to be a little more profitable as far as the compensation goes, but we're also looking for people who are excited about the the ability to move children forward. Um, and so putting those two things together, the financial package that we're hopeful to be able to offer the new teachers, as well as finding those teachers who have a desire to grow kids, um, we have used those things to try to attract people to our district and school. Wonderful. And Ms. Murdoch, we actually have a follow-up question for you from our audience. Okay. Um, could you describe the mentoring program for new teachers at your school or in Tipton County? I can. We have a mentoring program that the county provides and uh, gives us three different teachers in our building who are compensated to help our new teachers uh, in the areas of technology, lesson planning, uh, strategically working with our poverty kids. And they um, work with our new teachers uh, after school when needed as well as a structured meeting once a month. And then we also have our, our instructional coach who goes uh, to visit the new teachers more than the regular teachers. She's in their rooms at least once every single week to make sure that she's answering the questions, watching that new teacher um, unfold her lesson and be able to come back in during her planning period to explain the things that she has seen and answer any questions that the teacher may have. And I think that is, is one of the things that has moved us um, further than anything else that we do, is that we are sure to make sure that we mentor those teachers who are brand new to the teaching profession as well as brand new to Covington High School. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I actually have a question for Mr. Wilson. Um, so once, you've, once we've been able to find these great teachers, I would love for you to tell us about the specific ways that you all have used your hiring process to ensure that your school has the most effective teachers. Yes, Laura. Uh, thank you. That, that's a good question, the hiring process. And 
we we honestly become disenchanted with the hiring process we had in place several years ago, and uh, we would bring some uh, candidates in, and at the end of the day, we would be sitting at you know at the end of the day the same way we started, and we didn't have a clear cut. Uh, a person we wanted to offer that position to that you know all of them were good they can answer the questions and do all those things so what rose out of that was what we have now is a we feel a, a fairly rigorous process and it's a three-step process where we first in the first phase of our process we just post a position we accept letters of interest and resumes and uh, then we gather those in and then Jenny and I who's our other administrator to school side at John Sevier we go through those and see who are the most qualified uh, people that we feel are going to fit into our overall school philosophy. And then we bring those people in in a face-to-face -face screening type interview. This year, for example, we have two positions open in our school. Jenny and I personally talked to between 40 to 50 candidates face-to-face. -face. Now, we're not talking an hour conversation. It's, you know, a 10 to 15-minute conversation more than anything else, just trying to build a relationship and see if that person is going to fit into our school, you know, with, with what our uh, values and beliefs are. And uh, I, I think those soft skills that all of us look for here, this, our panelists and our, and our people listening in, I'm sure we're all looking for those similar things and those soft skills, that relationship building, that spirit of competition, the internal drive uh, that, that makes people who they are. And then our third and final phase is what we have found to be our separator, so to speak. And then that third and final phase, <clears throat> we mail out information to the candidates and give them every piece of information we can possibly give them about John Sevier Elementary. That includes from a demographic uh, standpoint to a data standpoint. And then we have different parts of that fi third and final phase where we bring them in in front of a committee that's comprised of a heterogeneous mixture of uh, personnel in the building. And they go about preparing a 30-minute PowerPoint presentation, and basically they're telling us about ourselves. And that's hard to do for people, you know, looking for a job to, to, to critique the people that, you know, they're, they're going after uh, to be employed at in a school site. But that's what they do. They also do some communication pieces where they uh, tell us how they're going to communicate with the students and the parents and uh, the entire community. And all total, that last uh, interview phase uh, encompasses about an hour. So we're looking forward to it this year. We've got some great candidates for those two positions, and we'll be going through that process next week. Uh, so it's worked for us, and we feel good about it, and it is giving us a clear-cut uh, uh, choice. And I also say in that phase three, we have a scenario, a, a lifelike scenario that actually happens in a classroom. And, and that's what seems to really make the difference is those scenarios and how those people respond to that. Wonderful. And Rick, we, we have a, a quick follow-up question for you from, from the audience. Um, they would like to know, are your local colleges of education involved in the hiring process in any way? And if so, how are they preparing students to meet, to meet the intense face-to-face -face hiring committee you all have at your school? Uh, they are involved with us locally. Uh, uh, schools such as Maryville College, we, we partner with them. We partner with Lincoln Memorial, uh, Tusculum College, we partner with them. And uh, they are very aware of our interview process and, and trying to prepare our student, you know, the, the candidates as well as they can. And, and what seems to be the most uh, difficult thing for, for uh, the teachers coming to us straight from college is the fact the data piece, you know, understanding that current data, because as you know, going through the shifts we went through the last two years here in our state, that data piece is, is changing all the time. And now, especially with us going from a pre-K to four school and having that value added piece, now along with the state, we're transitioning to that uh, first, second, third grade, you know, uh, value added piece in the future, it looks like. so. You know, trying to get the candidates up to par on, on that data piece is is our primary uh, communication with them. Gotcha. And one more quick question about the hiring process. Do you have your prospective teachers teach a lesson to your hiring committee? Uh, they actually do. As part of that PowerPoint presentation, that's what they have to prepare for, and it can be a lesson on anything of their choice as long as it fits into the current Common Core Standards curriculum and uh, in, in any of the four core subjects. 
Wonderful. That sounds like an extremely rigorous process. It's probably been very beneficial to you all to find the people who can not only do the job well, but also fit into your culture. It is, and, and our people tell us that get hired that uh, when they go through that process, they feel like right then that they know what it's going to take, you know, to survive, you know, uh, not only just at our school, but in any school in our state right now, you know, because it's a tough job, and, and it's a very demanding job, and uh, you've got to work hard at it. Absolutely. Um, and so shifting gears just a little bit, we've talked about how you find those teachers, um, how you hire them. And now I would love to focus a little bit on um, once you have that teacher in your building, um, sort of, and this question is for Mr. Blankenship, what types of feedback and ongoing support do you provide to your teachers to help them continually improve? First of all, it's, it's continual feedback, Laura, um, from the formal you know, team observations down to uh, what I call the uh, Mike Rutherford 32nd uh, uh, feedback. And uh, I, I reference Mr. Rutherford because we in Metro have uh, had a lot of training along that lines, and it is uh, all directed toward uh, feedback. But teachers are, are, are just like everyone else. They respond to positive and frequent feedback. So I, I have to be visible. I am uh, in the hallways and the classrooms every day. And, and I, I love to use what I call 30-second feedback, something I noticed they did in their classroom, uh, and simply uh, point out how it impacted the student. And then I'm on my way. I uh, found this to be very, very helpful, and teachers come back to me and say, Mr. B, I didn't know that I was doing that, or, or I see now what you're saying. So the, the feedback is, is uh, really continual. Now, we break that down into weekly meetings. Uh, I meet in teams. I like to meet on a more personal basis instead of a, a big faculty meeting every week or every month. We will meet weekly in teams where, uh, again, that's a, a, a process of, of pointing uh, out what the data is telling us and beginning discussions on how we can uh, better uh, structure our lessons and our planning. So uh, I also use my uh, instructional coaches in that process. Um, many times I, I will refer to them, uh, particularly if there's a, a problem with uh, language vocabulary. Uh, literacy coach is, is teamed with that teacher, and it becomes very individualistic. Um, so is being able to provide them with uh, on-the-spot, uh, frequent feedback, uh, and, and that's not to say there are things that we don't point out, you, that what I call constructive criticism. Uh, there are many times that our teachers are, are just not aware and they need a new set of eyes. So we have a lot of processes and systems in our school where uh, my expert teachers actually go in and, and visit each other. Uh, my assistant and I do the same thing. And uh, we, we build our PD around what we see the deficiencies, whether it be you know, uh, understanding data, whether it's uh, management, or whether it's just uh, uh, different delivery systems, uh, different teaching strategies. And um, what we're really trying to do is just build collaboration, and that's done through trust and, and teachers sharing with one another. Wonderful. Um, and just to remind the people on the line, um, all of the things that our panelists are talking about, there are some additional links that we're highlighting in the Q&A box, and there's files at the bottom um, as well that say more about some of the things that we've heard. Um, but Mr. Blankenship, I've um, got another question for you. You sort of mentioned using your, your expert teachers to go and visit and support other teachers in the building. And so would love to hear from you about some of those leadership opportunities that are available to um, some of your expert teachers in your building and um, how, how that helps you all to, to retain some of those effective teachers. Well, for, yes. Uh, I developed a, a, a little thing called Friends Among Friends, and it's really just critical friends. And what we do in our building, and I, and I realized real quickly that we have experts here. We, they're in our building. Uh, and and the, the challenge is, is really to 
free them up and find time for them to visit each other. And, and this is another Rutherford spinoff where we do uh, uh, visits to other classrooms and actually pepper that teacher with the positive things that we've, we've uh, noticed and also some things that we would ask to expand on. So we, we actually uh, free teachers up during the course of the day. Uh, it's pre-planned. Teacher knows we're coming. Uh, so it, it, it really isn't, um, shall I say, intimidating. Of course, it, it, it is always a problem when there are a lot of people, but these are your peers. And what I've seen happen in our building, uh, Laura, has been phenomenal. Uh, teachers who are great leaders are now stepping up. Uh, matter of fact, I've got one teacher that's going out to be uh, what we call a reward ambassador uh, for the state of Tennessee. I think there were 15 selected across the state, and, and she was one of the 15. Another teacher uh, is uh, re just received a one-year residency grant in leadership. So, and these were teachers that were directly involved, uh, very, very much so in this Friends Among Friends. Um, if you would, I'll share just a, a, a personal testimony to that. Uh, we, we were having some troubles in our language arts vocabulary, and uh, I uh, pulled the teachers together and said, let's go visit uh, this particular teacher I know is doing very well. Went into that classroom, did about a 20-minute observation, pulled the teacher back out. We were doing about a 15-minute uh, uh, briefing, and what came out of that was phenomenal. The teacher that was being observed had no idea, and this is the power of it, that her peers would uh, give her such confidence. Uh, the feedback was just uplifting. And, and this is, this is a, a, an outstanding teacher already. And what I saw was uh, collaboration being built. Uh, I just believe in, in uh, using your experts in your building, giving them the opportunity to collaborate, and then capitalizing on the positive. Absolutely, um, and I, I know that both Mr. Wilson and Ms. Murdoch feel similarly about leveraging their own highly effective teachers, and so would love to hear from them about ways in which they've engaged some of those highly effective teachers in leadership um, positions within the school. Uh, at Covington High School, we have uh, done our best to promote the leaders from within our school, and we have made uh, a teacher into an instructional coach doing what many of the other panel members are talking about going in and having a very informal visit and then the collaboration afterwards to make sure that the, the lesson unfolded as the lesson was planned to unfold and helping teachers to walk through with a seasoned teacher how other options could have made the lesson a little more uh, rigorous or following the Common Core approach a little more carefully. So we've used teachers to become uh, instructional coaches. Of course, the teachers that have been our department heads have been the ones who have gone in to do some of those critical visits and help the teachers in their department look more carefully at the content area. We've also used some uh, of the professional learning communities with our teachers as leaders of those instead of having the administration lead those. Uh, we've had the teachers to begin to be the leaders for those PLCs and making sure that they have um, a time to share about content, a time to share about rigor, and a time to set aside to look at the data points that we need so carefully to look at to make sure that we're moving along the path that we um, need to move. And then also we use teachers as mentors just uh, on a regular daily basis to make sure that we've got, uh, we tackle our mentoring with the, the teachers who are chosen from the, the uh, county level to make sure that they go out and use uh, the strategies that they've been taught to use. But we also use a next door neighbor and a content neighbor so that each of those people are feeling a little bit of leadership in the school system so that they have some kind of uh, strategies built as a leader before they think about moving into a leadership role. Wonderful. 
Mr. Wilson, do you have anything to add? I think I think at our at our school level at John Sevier, our expectation is that you know everyone becomes a leader, and that goes from uh, the teacher to the students all the way down. And it doesn't matter whether it's you know something as simple for the students as a safety patrol task or, or whatever you know the job responsibility may be, up to the teachers on our leadership team. Right now, currently, what we've adopted is a two-year rotation to where. Uh, the teachers know that they will be on that leadership team, you know, at least two years at some point, and, and you don't have uh, someone on there for a, a long period of time. And, you know, sometimes what we see is we see those teachers growing and becoming leaders that they themselves never thought they would become simply by by having to uh, encompass those, you know, the skill set that's required to be a leader. Uh, we use our leadership team to... Uh, kind of brainstorm and generate ideas and uh, we take it back out to the uh, general population of teachers they bring it back to the leadership team and then we reach a consensus on it uh, what our teachers have found you know being a leader is uh, it's it's difficult sometimes to take an information disseminate it back out bring it back and so forth so it's really helped them in a lot of ways uh, to be a leader and uh, and people in our school lead in so many different ways it's just it's just an expectation when they're hired in, and it begins with our hiring process. One of the things we ask them is, you know, we don't want you to come in and us be the only one giving. What are you going to bring to the table to stretch and grow all of us and make us better? So that's kind of in a nutshell. Uh, we kind of started with that philosophy from uh, the Covey book, The Leader and Me. But, you know, like with most things, I think, you know, the panelists here, I would think we don't, holistically adopt anything. We, we try to fit the needs of our general school and our staff and, and play off those strengths. And when you do that, I think you have a very eclectic approach to anything. Wonderful. Um, and so, Dr. Lynch, I, I would love to hear from you from, from the district perspective. We've, we've heard a lot from our score prize principals about the ways in which they foster collaboration among their teachers to um, share best practices and, and help teachers at all levels continue to improve. And so I would love to hear from your perspective about some of the ways that, that your district um, fosters that collaboration among your teachers and even some of the ways that you all use technology to share best practices among teachers and help them improve their practice. Thank you. Um, in making sure that uh, we are sharing best practices, I think our use of technology here in, in Hamlin County has, has helped us in that area. Uh, and we've done that through sharing best practices of, of lessons through podcasts. Uh, our website, uh, HCBOE, we think is, is one that is constantly changing and, and, update, and we're updating that regularly to make sure that uh, our teachers are looking at best practices from their, from their colleagues, just as the, the principals and panelists mentioned here that we can all learn from, from others. And uh, all of our schools here in Hamlin County, we have video conferencing rooms where we're able to, uh, we might not be able to be in the building at another school, but we sure can have that face-to-face -face communication. And we also have used video conferencing to, uh, to share best practices even outside of Hamlin County uh, from uh, the, the school systems in, in northeast Tennessee in the first district region of, of Tennessee. And, and I think that's one of the things that I've seen as a school system leader that's changed more in the last few years than anything else. It's, we're not so competitive, but we're really looking up about what strategies we can use and share and borrow from others. Uh, so I, I think, uh, I, I really thank our uh, superintendents in Northeast as well as across the, the entire state of Tennessee because we're working together and we can do that through technology. We can do that through video conferencing, FaceTime and Skype. And, um, we now are, are, are moving toward more video classrooms where teachers in their, own, in their own free time have the opportunity to reflect on their lessons that they're actually uh, videoing themselves and looking to see what could I have done better. And I kind of take this back to my old days in coaching when I first started teaching and coaching in that we would spend hours breaking down films and uh, and talk and spend time working about working and talking about how kids can do this better or that better and uh, so we need to do the same thing in instruction and I think that we've learned from that and we're continuing to to share those ideas with teachers 
uh, and I think it, can, it needs to be in a very non-threatening environment. Teachers need to feel like they're supported, not that this technology is something that's going to be a gotcha. Uh, the last thing in regards to technology, other than the great resources we provide for our teachers on our website, and other teachers as well, too, uh, but I'm really excited about the, the superintendency and the TOS organization and a partnership that we're working with, with school districts and looking at, at open source and, and digital textbooks and that we're, we're not, our, our kids are not just going to be consumers of this content. Our kids, our students now in Tennessee are going to be producers of content. That's where we really need to move. And when we talk about technology and what's, what's on the horizon, you know, if we'll, listen to, if we'll listen to kids, we'll learn quickly. So, uh, you know, I, I think meeting with all new teachers here in Hamlin County is one of the things that I do. And we talk about expectations here, and we talk about uh, making sure that they know where uh, the bar is set and what those expectations are for them. But uh, like Mr. Wilson said, uh, I, I learned so much from listening to new teachers as well as veteran teachers. We just have to be willing to, to share best practices like we're doing now. And I, I applaud the SCORE for providing these opportunities because we can learn from each other. Wonderful. And, and Dr. Lynch, we have um, a follow-up question for you from our audience. Um, they would like to know, with Common Core and other challenges that face classroom teachers, how open are your teachers to accepting student teachers in their classes? Oh, our, our teachers are very open to that. We have tremendous partnerships with, uh, with higher ed. And, and you know, we just, we're working with higher ed institutions to make sure that uh, they understand that we, we want student teachers who are committed to getting better as well, but we can learn from those student teachers also because, uh, you know, I, I truly believe that uh, we need to make sure that we partner and we pair those student teachers with outstanding teachers. We need to, to support those student teachers like, hey, you know, we're, we're also in a recruiting mode when we have student teachers. And uh, we want to try to find the very best that we can. But uh, our teachers are, are our, our best, our, our level four, level five teachers are absolutely supportive. And we're trying to continue to grow all of our teachers to make sure the, the more hands-on we have in the classroom with adults, uh, I think the better off it will be. Wonderful. Um, and just also wanted to pose that question to our other panelists. Um, how open are your teachers to, to opening their doors to student teachers? Laura, of course, you know, being in Metro Nashville, we're right in the middle of the universities with Vanderbilt, Belmont, Fisk, TSU, uh, Lipscomb, Trevecca, and then the list goes on. And uh, we actually at Rose Park welcome uh, student teachers. It gives us a, a, a chance to see what uh, the preparations are like out there, and we do give feedback. And it also is, is a, a powerful recruiting tool. Matter of fact, one of uh, our, our new teachers coming on board was a student teacher with us last year. So it, it really is invigorating uh, to see uh, young uh, aspiring teachers uh, come into your building. And I must say that uh, these universities are doing an outstanding job uh, in preparing them. Matter of fact, we actually house one of the upper level uh, classes for Belmont, which meets at our school every week. And uh, part of their uh, curriculum is to go into the classrooms, and it's usually about 20 to uh, 25 students, and work with our teachers, work with our students in small groups. And we've actually uh, expanded that uh, for the upcoming year to be twice a week. So. It's valuable to us, and we know it leads to uh, uh, greater gains and achievement with our students, and our teachers just love it. Well, Laura, we in Tipton County are partnering with the University of Memphis to make sure that we have open doors for uh, student teachers, and most of that is focused in grades three through six. Uh, so the high school has not been the recipient of two many uh, student teachers. The few that we get, we very much enjoy having them and getting new ideas from them and sharing our uh, proven ideas with, with the teachers that us. But the high school has not been the recipient of much of that lately. And we've got um, another question from the audience. 
um, about benchmarking and data access for teachers. Um, this person would like to know how many of you are using your own benchmarking process to determine mastery of standards? Um, and how many of you are using other programs like Discovery Education? And secondly, if you're using your own common benchmarking, how quickly can you get the data back to your teachers? Um, and do you ever have any problems in that regard? Uh, in Covington High School, we use both. We use uh, Discovery Ed to give uh, the testing for each of our tested areas. Uh, but the data comes back a little uh, late, and so we have incorporated in the last two years our own common uh, assessments across each one of the tested courses. And we give a four and a half week uh, test in every tested course. And we have that data given back to the teachers by the end of the day. And um, so we are very uh, we lean greatly on the data that we get from those benchmark testings, and uh, because they're so uh, they're so much more user friendly than a publisher can do, uh, you, we have that data immediately for the teachers to use for the next day's lesson. Laura, this is Rick, and I, I just think uh, to go along with that, I think. I think the state has done an excellent job recently with uh, the formative assessment tool, you know, partnering up with Patel, and that's helped greatly on a on a day to day and an ongoing basis. And as far as benchmarking, uh, we're very much uh, similar to other state schools. We use DEA and uh, STAR. Also, uh, you know, we've uh, had SAT10 this year. We did the pilot on it as well. So, uh, you know. The summative is an important piece for us as well, and to look at those, and it transcends over to what we do at our school level. Uh, once a month, we have what we call SAM meetings, which are student accountability meetings, or, and uh, we meet with our teachers each grade level during their planning periods, and uh, we talk about you know what the data shows us, and uh, it's uh, it's neat to see you know we have a group of five six teachers sit around the table and try to figure out. Uh, a way to get to a student that may not be their student, but it is a student, and it you know quickly gets a focus on every kid in your school, not just the kids in that teacher's class. Laura, this is Bob uh, Blankenship. We also use DEA and rely on it, but again, it's it's only three times a year. But we've developed, as I'm sure most of uh, the panelists have and teachers, uh, what we call a data room, and in that room. It actually doesn't just show achievement, but we're, we're tracking growth, and we're tracking growth in all the sub-skills, and actually it's a really good visual with uh, names of students uh, on, on individual scales. And what we do is we meet there at least a, once, if not twice a week with, with teachers to really drill down, find out where uh, the challenges are in their classroom and what they've done what we've asked them to do and they've done it with fidelity is, is to develop uh, what we call weekly probes it's it's a way to assess to find out if our students are moving in those weak areas you know one of the challenges that we have is is how to spend your time where to spend your time and we found that being able to to look at this data through DEA develop our own probes, uh, questions that are specific to each classroom and e even within the classroom specific to some sub just smaller groups. Uh, we track that weekly and it really has made a difference. Wonderful. And we're, we're nearing the end of our time together. So Dr. Lynch, I have a final question for you um, as a district leader. Would love to ask you, what advice would you give to other schools or districts that are struggling to ensure that they have effective teachers? I think one of the, the most powerful things that you have to do is what I think we've tried to do today is to define effective. And in defining effective, what, what type of effectiveness are you looking at? And, you know, whether it's student growth, uh, whether it's building relationships or ever how you define effective teachers is uh, as a leadership team, as an individual, as a school system leader, uh, make sure that you're able to personally define what, what effective is. Then put in place and put in practices uh, uh, ways that you can go out and you can recruit. And I think we need to start even, you know, we're looking at trying to 
make sure that we find our best and brightest in our own high schools first and encourage them to go into education. There's not a greater profession, and we, we don't need to sell ourselves short because this is hard work, but it is good work. And uh, we need to talk to our, our high school students about entering the field of education because the way that we're going to improve education is, is to look to hire the greatest people that we can find in our colleges and universities. And so uh, I'm all about trying to grow our own, and we grow our own early. And uh, so recruiting and then making sure that we provide outstanding support systems like these principals that you've heard from today. Uh, I hope the superintendents don't get mad because I may be trying to recruit those too. But uh, we all just need to work together in Tennessee, and I think that's what we're doing. But uh, And then provide those supports for those teachers to let them know that uh, that they're in a safe environment where it's okay to fail because that's where we learn most in the areas where we need to continue to grow and uh, then provide those supports. And uh, I thank SCORE for, for helping us with this endeavor. Thank you so much for those, final, for those final words, Dr. Lynch, and thank you to all of our panelists and all the folks on the call for being part of the discussion today. If you would like to learn more about these schools and districts and their work to improve student achievement, you can please visit the SCORE Prize website at tnscore.org slash score prize. 